This week on the show, we have Linux couldn't duplicate OpenBSD, then the FreeBSD quarterly status report for the last quarter of 2019. We covered the all new OpenSense version 19.7.9. Archives retain and pass on knowledge, so it's good to blog for yourself. Uh, Harden BSD, the Tor Onion service nodes have been activated, and more in this week's episode of BSD Now. BSD Now, episode 336, Archive Knowledge, recorded on the 5th of February 2020. Hello, I'm your host, Benedict Kreuschling. And I'm Alan Jude. And I'm not dead. <laughs> yeah, in our original setting, as you know us. But uh, thanks again for all the people who helped out in the past episodes. And now we're in our original, well, almost original, the original, original setting thanks. would have uh, been with Chris. Thanks very much to JT for uh, filling in for me uh, two weeks ago while I was uh, ill. Uh, had my gallbladder out, but I'm all on the mend now and back to usual. Uh, Alan got some shiny Borg implants. That sounds much better. I didn't have anything implanted, only things removed. <laughs> it's just Z-Pool replace, right? Um, <laughs> Detach, but anyway. <laughs> Detach, right, that's better. Uh, let's go into the headlines uh, before we uh, rear off more. Uh, we have OpenBSD has to be a BSD Unix, and you couldn't duplicate it with Linux from Chris Seibenman. You know, we, we talk a lot sometimes when we're comparing BSDs and Linuxes of how, you know, it's a whole system all at once. But we often fail to explain why that matters. Uh, and this article about OpenBSD from our friend uh, Chris Seidman, uh does a great job of actually doing that. So it goes. OpenBSD has a well-deserved reputation for putting security in a clean system, as far as code, documentation, complexity, etc., uh, first, and everything else second. OpenBSD is a course based on BSDs, it's right there in the name, and is a descendant of NetBSD. Uh, and there's a link to the history if you want to go back that far in time. Anyway, uh, but one of the questions you could ask is whether it had had to be that way, right? Could OpenBSD have existed as uh, a Linux distro or something? And in particular, if you could build something like OpenBSD on top of a Linux and Chris believes the answer to that is actually no. So Linux and the BSDs have a significantly different model of what they actually are. The BSDs have a base system uh, that provides an integrated and fully operational core Unix. So that's a kernel, the C library, the compiler, and all the normal Unix uh, user level programs and tools, and they're all maintained and distributed as a unit. Whereas with Linux is not a single unit this way, and instead, all of the component parts are maintained separately and then assembled in various ways by various different Linux distributions. Both approaches have their advantages, but one big advantage of the BSD approach is that it enables global change. So making global changes is an important part of, of what makes OpenBSD's approach to improving security, code maintenance, and so on actually work. Because it directly maintains everything as a unit, BSD is in a, or OpenBSD is in a position to introduce, say, new C library calls or new kernel ABIs or change existing ones, uh, and then immediately update all of the other parts of the base system that use that so that they'll work with it and that the programs can take advantage of these new APIs. This takes a certain amount of work, of course, but it's possible to do it all as a unit. And because OpenBSD can do this sort of ambitious global change, it does. And that's why... OpenBSD doesn't guarantee compatibility between versions because they make these types of global changes. This goes further than just the ability to make a global change, because in theory, you can patch in global changes on top of a bunch of separate upstream projects. Uh, because OpenBSD is in control of its entire base system, it's not forced to try to reconcile different development priorities or integrate clashing changes. You know, if you tried to make a global change like this in Linux, you'd have the problem of, oh, we have to update all these other uh, open source projects that provide components to our Linux distro that are going to use this new API or whatever, or the, the use the API that we're about to change. And while you can send patches to all of them, when they will next have a release that you can then incorporate, and what other changes might be in that release that you're not ready for yet, uh, could really cause you all kinds of headaches. Whereas when you control all of the components, 
uh, it's much easier to make these global changes. And, you know, if it's all under one umbrella, it's much easier to do the organization of making sure, all right, we're going to integrate this change in all these programs and make sure that we're not introducing any unexpected changes uh, and get it all done. So OpenBSD can decide, and has many times, that only certain sorts of changes will be accepted into its system at all. And no matter what people want, uh, this is what they get. It's OpenBSD. If there are features or entire programs that just don't fit into OpenBSD, then OpenBSD will remove them. Uh, and he goes on. Uh, Chris says, I suspect that this decision on priorities gives OpenBSD uh, more leverage to push other people in directions that it wants. Uh, because the OpenBSD developers are clearly willing to remove support for something if they feel strongly enough about it. For example, Chris suspects that the new system call origin verification feature that they've added to OpenBSD is going to eventually force Go, the programming language, to make system calls only through OpenBSD's C library, contrary to what Go prefers, which is doing them directly. Huh. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I don't have a very informed opinion on it, but I, I from my experience with other languages like uh, JRuby and so on having these problems where when they didn't go through the C library, it meant that, oh, when we changed um, the inode structure to support 64-bit inodes, uh, all of those things caused problems for quite a while until they managed to fix it. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, we had the problem of, oh, so we coordinated with the upstream project, the Java native interfaces tool or library to update to know that, oh, if you're beyond FreeBSD 12, these fields are different when you call the syscall. But even once they had integrated the fix, we had to wait until they released a new version. And once they did release it, we needed a downstream consumer of it, JRuby, to then pull in that change uh, and have their next release uh, so that we'd have a version of JRuby that could actually run on FreeBSD 12. Uh, and then we could finally make you know, Puppet Server 6 work on FreeBSD 12 and later. Uh, and so there was, you know, this dependency chain, uh, and it ended up taking like a year to get the change we wanted done uh, because of these, you know, you happen to work with third parties and they just have different priorities and different release schedules. Whereas if everything is a component of your operating system, then you can make these changes uh, much more easily. And in particular, you know, in most applications just worked on FreeBSD because they use the C library to make the stat call or whatever. Uh, and so our compatibility shim ensured that everything worked. But when applications were calling the system call directly, uh, like Go does and like um, uh, JRuby stuff was doing, uh, you end up with these problems. Yeah, and that needs adapt adopting then to those operating systems that do it this way. And you know, if you're trying to do the same thing in Linux, you'd have the problem of, okay, so the Linux kernel has this new thing, but now we have to get it into glibc and other libcs like musl and so on, so that they'll support it. And then we have to wait for distros to actually ship that version. And, you know, it can be a lot different. And it's basically the advantage that OpenBSD gets of being uh, this concentrated set of base system uh, that they control and they can tweak whatever they want uh, and have control over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes it coherent. And, you know, most of this applies to all the BSDs, although, uh, you know, in FreeBSD, we try to avoid making these types of changes between minor versions and only do it between major versions. But, you know, there's pros and cons to both of those. Oh, yes, for sure. So as our next item, we have the FreeBSD quarterly status report for the fourth quarter of 2019. And that's a lot of items, of course. But it starts with um, that they... Well, uh, that's the greeting message at the beginning. And uh, it goes a little further in the second paragraph. If you thought that the FreeBSD community was less active in the Christmas quarter, you will be glad to be proven wrong. A quick glance at the summary will uh, be sufficient to see that much work has been done in the last months. So there's someone, uh, always someone else who writes the introductory letter. And this one is from Lorenzo Salvadore. And uh, that leads into the actual uh, status report. So this is the fourth quarter of 2019. Uh, starting with team reports uh, from the core team, the foundation, the release engineering team, the cluster admin team, and continuous integration. Then there's the section projects. Uh, we have the IPsec extended sequence number supports, the NFS version 4.2 implementation, DTS update rock chip supports for the embedded uh, 
dashboard and creating a virtual FreeBSD appliance from our EVMDK image. Uh, so yeah, uh, interesting, like the NFS uh, 4.2 stuff uh, talks about RFC 7862, describes a new minor version of the NFS v4 protocol. Uh, this adds optional features to NFS, such as support for seek data and seek whole, file copying done on the server side. So, you know, if you want to copy some data from one file to another or something over NFS, you don't have to download all the data and re-upload all the data. You can say, hey, on the server side, could you just do this work for me? Support for the POSIX F allocate, uh, POSIX F advise, and a bunch of other features. At this point, the project is basically completely complete, uh, and the changes have all been committed to FreeBSD uh, head and will be part of FreeBSD 13. Uh, currently, clients need to manually specify minor version equals 2 to enable the 2.4 support uh, until it has more testing. Uh, and the 2.1 support is already there, so that's uh, some of the support for PNFS, uh, where you can actually have a more distributed NFS layout. Uh, we talked about that before. Yeah, that, that we should test more, I guess. Currently, what uh, Rick is working on is the kernel TLS support for NFS, although that's a very big project. So, Yeah, this is a, a snapshot report of what the current status is. Uh, then we have, uh, from the kernel side, they have a uh, system on chip audio framework and the RK3399 audio drivers, uh, FreeBSD on Microsoft Hyper-V and Azure, uh, FreeBSD on EC2 ARM64, and ENA FreeBSD driver updates in that section. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's quite a bit of different stuff going on here. Um, the one we kind of glossed over, the creating virtual appliances, this is um, a new FreeBSD-MKOVA tool that will actually create the .OVA images, which is basically uh, a VMware-style VMDK and a, I think an XML configuration file inside a tar file and named .OVA. But it means that if you download it, and double click on it, it will open in whichever hypervisor you have, whether that's VirtualBox or VMware. I, I think uh, Microsoft's Hyper-V supports it too. Uh, and it will just set up the virtual machine in a way that's agnostic to whichever hypervisor you're using. Oh, that, very nice. So uh, that'll be a great tool as well. Yeah, that gives the uh, needed flexibility in this space. Yeah. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we already talked about the FreeBSD on EC2 ARM64. So you can actually run FreeBSD 12.1 on the ARM uh, EC2 instances at uh, Amazon. There's been updates to make the FreeBSD work better on Hyper-V uh, over at, at Microsoft's Azure Cloud. And then lots of architecture update stuff as well. Um, Clang working on PowerPC. It's uh, almost there where they'll be able to get away from the GNU tool chain. Good work by uh, a bunch of different people there, uh, and both in FreeBSD and upstream at the Clang and LLVM projects. Oh, yeah. Always good to have that support. Yeah, and I know uh, Edward Naparala has been doing work on the Linux compatibility layer. Um, so Linux binaries for the Linux test projects tests are now part of the FreeBSD continuous integration infrastructure. Uh, so this makes it easy to track progress in improving the Linux compatibility layer and then also detect any regressions. So we basically run the whole Linux test projects test suite against the FreeBSD Linux emulation layer uh, so we can see what's going on. Uh, since there is a fair number of all kinds of improvements to the layer, uh, including an updated man page, a new Linux RC script, uh, which now takes care of mounting Linux-specific file systems or setting the ELF fallback brand, uh, of dealing with new syscalls or tiny improvements like making control T work in Linux binaries. Woohoo! Finally, at least this kind of support. Yes. Um, from the user point of view, when running uh, FreeBSD 13, Linux jails are now in an almost working state. You can SSH into the jail uh, with CentOS 8 binaries, run Screen, Emacs, Postgres, OpenJDK 11, and run Yum Upgrade. Uh, and of course, there's still a bunch of things that need some work. Uh, there's a patch still coming in that makes core dumps work for Linux binaries, which will make debugging easier. And there are pen reviews to extended attribute support, um, fexec, ve, send file, and uh, some other stuff that require wrapping up and committing. And there are currently 400 failing Linux test project tests. Uh, some of these are false positives, but a bunch of them are easy bug fixes, and some will require adding new syscalls and so on. But anybody who's interested in improving uh, the Linux compatibility layer on FreeBSD is uh, 
encouraged to help out. But uh, the fact that you can actually stand up a CentOS 8 jail uh, and SSH into it as if it was a virtual machine uh, means we're getting pretty far. Oh, yeah. We're, we're catching up. Uh, then Ports has done lots of updates, uh, including new versions of Chromium and Firefox and Firefox ESR, updating the Qt stack. The Palm category has been removed, and the virtual IPv6 category has been removed since IPv6 support is now normal for applications rather than you often requiring a different application or a modified version of the application. Also, the CentOS 6 ports have been removed, uh, and the CentOS 7 counterparts are now the default. And I, I don't. I think the CentOS 8 stuff has been added, but it might not be actually in the tree yet. Um, a bunch of default versions have been updated. The various framework updates to the ports tree itself. Uh, Thirty X runs by Antoine, so thank you for that. And lastly, uh, OpenJDK 6 and OpenJRE 6 have been removed. But you know we have. Uh, JDK 11, 12, and 13, so we don't really need 6 anymore. <laughs> yeah, there's plenty of choice now for other versions. Yeah, uh, but I think 11 is the long-term support one currently, uh, although I think 13 or 14 will be the next long-term support. So, And then we have something in there that uh, caught a lot of attention when it was uh, announced on Twitter. Electron and uh, Visual Studio Code is also available now in FreeBSD ports or as a package uh, that has been ported. Yes, uh, so it looks like uh, Electron 4 and 6 are now supported, uh, which means that you can run a lot of Electron-type applications, like Visual Studio Code, uh, which is apparently a nice uh, IDE for doing development. Um, also, Adam, the editor that uh, the GitHub folks did, uh, is currently a work in progress and is based on Electron 4. Uh, but thanks to everyone for all their hard work uh, in getting this up and running. Uh, and I look forward to a couple more apps getting in there uh, so I have less reason to have to use a different device. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're, we're moving slowly everything over. Uh, then uh, updates on the uh, Bastille project, which is a uh, or creating a universal uh, packaging tools for container, as far as I understood it. Yeah, um, automating deployment and management of containerized applications. On FreeBSD. Yeah. Um, so it supports both thin and thick jails, uh, supports including FSTab uh, templating system, uh, has GitLab CI CD testing, automatic template validation and CVE scans, uh, and a dedicated PF table for private IP jails. Uh, but yeah, so it's basically designed to make Docker like container um, collection that you can just say, hey, best deal. I want a mail server, and it will spit one out. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's news of the universal packaging tool. Uh, that's, I think we mentioned it also from an earlier episode that someone was working on that, uh, which is basically a tool designed to easily port software from common upstream package archives, uh, like uh, RubyGems, for example, to various operating systems, including FreeBSD. Yeah, so this is kind of... Um, currently, they have... There are other tools like this called like Pi to Port, which turns a, a PyPy package into a FreeBSD port, or Gem to Deb, which turns a Ruby Gem into a Debian package. Um, but this one is looking at, you know, I know it's something that uh, Baptiste and some of the other people working on PKG discussed years ago was, hey, if we could get it so that package could just be like, oh, you want a Ruby Gem? Let me just go get the Ruby Gem and turn it and register it properly in our package database. Um, then it would take a lot of the maintenance work out of the ports tree of having to have every Ruby gem somebody might want added to the ports tree and every PyPy package and every CPAN package and, you know, for each of these different programming languages. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this, this one uh, looks like it will convert PyPy packages into ports or you know, they have another example here of doing Ruby gems and so on. So uh, that looks quite interesting. Yeah, so it looks like they have support for Python, Ruby, and Perl uh, things to basically mostly automate the process of turning those upstream packages into FreeBSD packages. Oh, yeah. Very nice. That helps. That looks very useful. Mm -hmm. uh, then we have updates on Wine. 
A lot has happened since our last quarterly update. The Wine 4 release series has been in our tree for nearly a year and has proven stable. Um, both that port and the Wine-Develop port, which tracks the bi-weekly development releases, have seen regular adjustments to infrastructure uh, and changes for the rest of the ports tree, plus small improvements themselves, and uh, also working around needing non-default options. Uh, now we need your help. So uh, WoW64, or Wine on Wine64, allows running 32-bit and 64-bit Windows applications off a single installation instead of needing to have separate versions of Wine. Uh, so the idea is a general framework for lib32 companion libraries and an approach directly using uh, the Wine ports. Uh, to make this work, uh, we do not have the expertise currently or the other bits required to facilitate proper review, test, and maintenance. So if you're interested in uh, Wine, that'd be great. So if you can facilitate getting at least some of these into the tree, uh, please help. And uh, they'd love to do co-maintainership on a lot of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that helps uh, everyone using those ports. And you learn a little bit about porting, which is uh, interesting. Yep. And then we have updates on a bunch of third-party packages, like uh, sysctl by name dash improved, uh, which is a tool uh, for making it easier to explore sysctls. Uh, pot, which is a um, container framework uh, for FreeBSD, and the Nomad driver to use it as a uh, like a cluster orchestration tool uh, are there. There's also this other tool called the Seven Day Challenge. It's an educational initiative to help people uh, onboard with FreeBSD more easily. It uses a combination of tutorials, guides, and how-tos to get users engaged with FreeBSD quickly, specifically uh, targeting end goals a user might have with FreeBSD and more. The primary objective is to demonstrate FreeBSD's capabilities as a modern, relevant operating system in today's cloud-centric automated business model. Um, but I think that's an interesting idea because, yeah, your experience with FreeBSD over the first seven days is probably what's going to make the biggest difference to deciding if you're going to stick with it or not. Uh, so actually having the material to how, to keep you going for those first seven days uh, probably make a big difference on our adoption rate. So I, I need to look at that and hope uh, other people can help jump in on that. Mm -hmm. uh, and lastly, an update on Nomad BSD, which is a persistent live system on a USB stick based on FreeBSD. Uh, together with automated hardware detection and setup, it is configured to be used as a desktop system that will just work you have a USB stick, plug it into a computer, and it should just work. Uh, it can be used for data recovery or education or testing or just having, you know, make FreeBSD run on whatever computer you happen to be sitting at. Uh, after one release candidate, the Nomad team has finished their release of Nomad BSD 1.3 uh, in December. This release is based on FreeBSD 12.1, uh, fixes a lot of bugs, and adds new packages and features. Among those features are the option to install Nomad BSD on ZFS and use an automatic... Uh, configuration when running Nomad BSD in VirtualBox. Oh. Uh, also, new tools were developed by the Nomad team and added to version 1.3, like Nomad BSD-DM config to select a display manager theme, and Nomad BSD-add user, which is a graphical way to add a user, um, and a tool for changing the background images, and a bunch of others, all based on Qt. Mm -hmm. uh, but they're looking for people to help with uh, translations, artwork, uh, building new tools and extending existing ones, uh, testing and bug reports uh, for the user experience and features, and are also looking to support installation on disk partitions or add a disk partitioning editor GUI uh, and support complete disk encryption and adding a better uh, user-friendly network manager. Oh yeah, so the report has even more items that we could cover here, especially from the various teams, uh, and we recommend you read the whole thing. Uh, or pick certain items out of it that are interesting to you. Yeah, uh, it is definitely uh, an easy way to keep up with uh, what's been going on. Yeah, even if you just follow the quarterly updates, uh, you get an idea how some projects like uh, have evolved over the last uh, quarter or what, what's the update or if, what, what new things are coming up uh, in the meantime. Yeah, so thanks for everyone who helped uh, assemble and uh, submitted updates to the quarterly status report and uh, releasing it on time. Time for the news roundup this week. It's OpenSense 19.7.9, which has been released. Uh, this is our news item here. And on OpenSense, we can read the release notes here as a little message. Yeah, so this, is, this came out in... December, I guess. Uh, no, January 14th. Um, but they're getting close to releasing version 20.1, which is their uh, 
quarterly or half yearly release for 2020. Uh, but in the meantime, they have this update to the uh, the second half of the 2019 version. Uh, for now, this update brings you a Geo IP database configuration page for aliases, which are now required due to the upstream database policy changes. Yeah, the MaxMine Geo IP people, uh, because of the way the law has changed in California, California considers MaxMine to have sold you something every time you download a file from them. Ooh. Even though they maybe it was free, it, they still completed a sale or whatever. Uh, and so now you have to be registered to download stuff, and it's uh, made it a little annoying to update your GIP database. Okay. Uh, but uh, basically, OmaSense has uh, worked around that for you and, and uh, updated some other software so it won't have the problem. Um, they've also made some other changes. Uh, when generating a new certificate, it uses 825 days as the default maximum lifetime. I'm I'm not sure why that number, but that number. It's yeah. Like two years in a bit. Mm. <laughs> anyway. Um hide leaking the host name on SSH password auth. Um so the host name in the machine doesn't show up, uh isn't sent to the uh client when they have to log in. Um they remove the unused lifetime parameter from the user management page. Um they've fixed up the new GIP settings to allow continued use of upstream database. And also logged when aliases can't resolve a host name, uh, so that you'll know why that firewall rule won't work. Uh, and they've also improved translations of some of the PF info page tabs. That's worthwhile updating. They've replaced the kill by name uh, function, uh, since it should not be used to kill both services and other stuff. Uh, and they've fixed the auto replace the Windows DUID dashes for DHCP. Uh, and I updated a bunch of plugins, new versions of Acme Client, Bind, DynDNS, FRR, MailTrail, or MailTrail, uh, Nginx, um, Nut, which is the um, U- U battery backup manager, um, and the new version of Zabbix Proxy, and updated ports for OpenSSH, OpenSSL, PHP, PHP Seclib, Python, StrongSwan, Sudo, and Unbound. Okay, yeah, that should give you... Uh bunch of updates with uh, security fixes and uh, of course we uh, will also announce when the major release is out and cover this then we found a very nice article in uh, the archive of many other good articles of Dan Langill uh, known as BSDCAN and PGCon organizer of many other things as well uh, he has a story or an article here called archives are important to retain and pass on knowledge so he says, you know, archives are important. When they are public and available for searching, it retains and passes on knowledge. It saves vast amount of time. Case in point, I started a copy backup to tape job earlier uh, today, which was January 7th. At that, uh, and he saw this message show up in his D message. Uh, you know, SA0, which is the tape drive, MPS0, which is his HBA. Um, 64,512 byte tape record is bigger than the supplied buffer. So they, uh oh, do I have a tape problem? Do I have a setting problem? A driver problem? I don't know. So he did some searching. When searching for this, I found a FreeBSD forum post from 2016 where he learned that this particular error is not a problem. It is a test uh, that the driver does when it first starts up to see how big of a buffer it can use. Uh, so it's just informational, not an indication of an error. Uh, so he found that on this nice FreeBSD forum article, uh, which actually. When he read it a little bit further, uh. he saw that um, in that forum post, he linked to a mailing list. <laughs> so when he, he found the problem, the, the user having the problem and the solution in the forum, but when he scrolled a little bit further, he sees that he replied to the forum post <laughs> back in 2016 <laughs> and linked a mailing list archive uh, from a thread he started asking a very similar question <laughs> and got. Uh, an answer from Ken Mary, who's one of the you know scuzzy masters of the universe. <laughs> yeah, uh, and he says yes. This is just informational. It tells you that the tape blocks are sixty four thousand five hundred twelve bytes long, uh, or at least the first one is. The initial tape mount inside the SA driver does a test read with an eight K buffer. This is to get the tape drive to actually look at the media, so it will know uh, if there's any media there. We don't necessarily expect that the initial read uh, will read in a whole block, 
but the sense data that comes back from the tape drive will tell us how big that first block is. Uh, we could silence it or perhaps use a bigger uh, buffer to start with, so uh, you'd get an error in the case where you can't read the block uh, size written to the tape. I think it is somewhat helpful to know how big the block size is. So anyway, Dan goes on. Uh, what was fun for me was that this thread refers to the FreeBSD SCSI mailing list uh, from 2015, where Dan had asked this question and gotten the answer. The irony is that Ken was answering Dan's question back in 2015, uh, and Dan had just completely forgot about this. <laughs> but it's just funny that when he Googled for it, he ended up finding a forum post where he had related to the person having the problem, here's me asking this problem a couple of years before and getting an answer. <laughs> yeah, it all comes back to you. So Dan had the right response, which was to write a blog about it, post that, and record it, and hopefully next time someone will find his blog post, which has links to the answers on the forum and the mailing list, and he doesn't end up finding out, uh, again, in a roundabout way, that, hey, Dan, you already asked this question and got an answer, you know, five years ago. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> but yes, the, the number of times that uh, I've run into the same problem as Dan and was very thankful that Dan wrote down how he got the answer. Yeah. But the other thing that Dan often does is you'll see uh, he blogs every time he does something on his servers. Uh, so when he does a process like replacing some drives or something, he will write a blog about it. So A, if he runs into a problem, he can send that link to me and be like, all right, here's what it looked like before. That's super important. Always get before snapshots of like your list of disks and zpool status and all as much information you can about what the system looked like before you touched it. It's very helpful for debugging. But anyway, so Dan will say, all right, here's what it was before. Here's the commands I did and the output I got. And now this isn't working. What do I need to do? Uh, and it makes it really, really easy for me to help him. Whereas other people will be like, I'm getting this error message. I'm like, well, what did you do? He's like, I don't remember. <laughs> that doesn't help much. I'm like, well, <laughs> it's a lot harder to know what went wrong if I don't know what it looked like before and what you did to it. Luckily, you know, Zpool history keeps track of most of the ZFS commands you did, but still. Uh, so yes, be a good guy, be like Dan, write down what it looked like before and what you did to it as you do it. And if you're doing it anyway, you might as well post it because this way when someone else needs to do the same thing, they can benefit uh, from your pain. <laughs> oh yeah. And he closes with future you will thank you. Well, let's see. <laughs> yes. Because uh, the other one was, I remember when I first discovered the FreeBSD Diary, which is Dan's previous blog, um, sometimes it was literally just me looking at it and being like, okay, so Dan's got articles on how to do a bunch of weird things. Which of those might I want to learn how to do? Mm -hmm. uh, and some of them, it was just like, oh, there's a cool thing I could do. Uh, and it was just, you know, oftentimes when you're experimenting with a BSD, you're like, well, what should I do? And if you don't have a specific project in mind, it can be harder to, to want to go learn something. But if you have, uh, you know, an idea of what other people have done before, you might give you an idea of what you might want to play with. Mm -hmm. And over time, you have this nice article and archive of collection. Yes. Uh, and, you know, Dan does it for himself. And it is proven time and time again that it's very helpful to himself. Uh, and then, hey, bonus, he's helping a bunch of other people too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Number one, do it for yourself. And number two, share, because why not? Mm -hmm. Doesn't cost you much. A little bit of a time, but uh, that, pay, that time is paid back. Yes. Uh, the time you'll save just for yourself uh, will be worth it. But also, like I said, every bit of that you have, the more of it you have, the easier it is to ask for help as well. Uh, then we found the HardenBSD Tor Onion service version 3 nodes are in place or available. Uh, that's a message from HardenBSD.org. And Sean Webb writes here that uh, he's been working on deploying the Tor Onion service v3 nodes across their build infrastructure and is happy to announce that the public portion of this is now completed. Below you will find various Onion service host names and their match to their infrastructure. So there's a bunch of nodes uh, that all ends with .onion. And you can find also GPG signed version of this post in case you are really paranoid and want to verify that this is true and uh, original. And so, yeah, you can use these to enter the Tor Onion service. 
Now it's time for the Beastie Bits this week. We have uh, as our first item the missing semester of your CS education, which is an MIT course. And everyone is like, why did I miss anything? I got my degree and did I miss anything? So this class uh, teaches you all of the advanced topics within computer science from operating systems to machine learning, but there's one uh, critical subject that's rarely covered, and that is instead left to students to figure out on their own, the proficiencies with their tools. We'll teach you how to master the command line, how to use powerful editors, and use fancy features of version control systems, and much more. Uh, so this is all of the, you know, everyday stuff that uh, you would benefit from uh, that they don't generally include in a CS uh, course. Mm-hmm. You know, students spend hundreds of hours using these tools over the course of their education, so it makes sense uh, to make that experience as fluid and frictionless as possible. Uh, mastering these tools not only enables you to spend less time figuring out how best to bend your tools to your will, but it also lets you solve problems that would previously seem impossibly complex. You know, it's definitely something you see uh, when I was teaching classes like this. People that had a bit of experience before and knew about a couple of the tools, it was much easier for them to. Um, go through uh, a lot of the the steps and so on because they had seen some of this stuff before. Uh, and, you know, if you've played with the basics of command line stuff and you know about grep and sort and so on and just how pipes work, suddenly it unlocks all of these bits for you. So yeah, uh, this class is uh, very useful. So it covers basics of the shell, uh, tooling and scripting with the shell, how to use Vim, how to wrangle data, um, more about command line environment using version control, um, which is something that I've seen like every developer I've ever interviewed, which mostly been web developers and so on, all claim they know how to use version control stuff. Uh, and, you know, the team I worked with, oh, that would have been 2012 or something, um, they could all check things in to SVN and update things from SVN but they didn't really understand how to deal with merge conflicts and they definitely didn't understand how to deal with branches. Uh, so that's not really understanding version control. <laughs> <laughs> you know, maybe, maybe the concept as you've never, uh, you know, reversed yourself out of a uh, uh, conflict here or uh, branch. Yes, you can use version control to keep track of your copy of your software, but when you're working with a team, other people are editing files too and you have to be able to deal with that. Uh, anyway, and then it has debugging and profiling, metaprogramming, security, and cryptography, and then just a, a potpourri day where it's just, you know, keyboard mappings and fuse and backups and APIs and uh, window managers and VPNs and markdown and uh, all kinds of other stuff. And on each of those, you will find the video recording so you can feel like a student again listening to that lecture. And yeah, it's free knowledge available uh, for you to check out. Yeah, that's some good stuff. Uh, next up, we have an image from a Reddit thread of this is a print ad for an early version of Unix. So it has a, a big seashell there and it says, try listening to Unix. That's what we do at Unix Review. We listen, we look and probe. It's surprising how much there is that's fresh and new, just waiting to be shared. It's often the way uh, with things that are simply elegant, like a shell, hence the seashell, uh, like Unix. So subscribe to Unix Review, <laughs> the magazine for the Unix community. Okay, yeah. Uh, so Unix Review is offered by the publica uh, publishers of CPM Review. Uh, Unix Review is $23 per year for your bi-monthly uh, editions. Uh, and you can also get CPM Review for $18 a year for your bi-monthly editions. So fill out your name, address, and uh, your Visa or MasterCard number and uh, mail this back to us. Mm -hmm. Way back when, when Unix was still at Bell Labs. Okay, uh, coming back to a little bit more modern times, uh, OpenBSD has a syscall call from verification system now. Yeah, so that was uh, what we were talking about in the very opening story. And we've talked about this a bit before because it, it was, you know, this first bit of it was from the very end of November. But yeah, so it's a bunch of changes to OpenBSD that permit system calls only from the address ranges of a process uh, that are, they're expected from. So that if a program is exploited, if a bug is exploited, um, then it can't just randomly start making syscalls. If you manage to upload exploit code containing raw system calls and mprotect it minus write and plus x, 
Suddenly that box, such as a system call, will not succeed, but instead the process will be killed because it made a syscall when it wasn't supposed to, or from an, a memory area it wasn't supposed to. This obliges the attacker to use libc uh, system call stubs for everything, which is some uh, in some circumstances is difficult to find because libc is randomly relinked each time you reboot an OpenBSD machine. So no two machines are the same, uh, and even the same machine will change every time it's rebooted. Uh, so if you didn't see this when we covered a bit of it before, you can check it out, and uh, I imagine there's actually some updates to it since then too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work has been going on. Uh, then we have OpenBSD slash ARM64 on Pinebook. Uh, this is a tweet by Patrick Wilt. And with, oh, with working wireless, USB and graphics. So this is the Pinebook. There's a picture of the laptop and has an OpenBSD login screen, uh, a graphical login screen, I have to say. And seems to work fine. So people have ported that. Yep, and I see uh, Menu, uh, who works on the Pinebook stuff on FreeBSD, uh, asking whether it was using the DRM driver or the simple frame buffer. And it looks like it is actually using the DRM stuff, but not some of the more advanced stuff like CMA and GEM. But work in progress. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll keep our eyes peeled for that. And then we have a couple of reminders for meetups and BSD user groups. Uh, the first one, the uh, first Southern Ontario BSD user group meeting from February 11th. This Tuesday, oh, coming. Uh, yes, it's very close. Our, our meetup is, is coming soon, so hopefully we can uh, see a bunch of people come out. So yes, uh, after being uh, badgered by <laughs> uh, some other people that wanted to do this, I yeah, we just uh, picked a place and a date and said we'll have the first one. Uh, we'll just get a bunch of people together and talk about BSD and also plan out how we want to do the future meetings. Uh, you know, do we need a better? You know, does this meeting place work? Should we find a better one? Uh, how often should we do the meetings? What day of the week works best? Um, what should we call the group? And we get a real website and Twitter account and so on. Right now, I'm just using my old domain name I bought many, many years ago uh, when I was first starting to teach BSD uh, to put my study material on. Um, we also want to look at if we should try to do it in the same place every time uh, or if we should actually try to move to different cities. You know, I know, I think... Ed Mass is going to try to make the trip down uh, from Kitchener to Hamilton, uh, which is like 50 kilometers or more, uh, to come to the meetup. But it might be nice if some future meetup was in his neck of the woods and he didn't have to go as far. But at the same time, if we're trying to get the same group of people together on a regular basis, it might be better to have it in one place. So uh, we'll have to see how that goes. Mm -hmm. um, but that's one of the things we discussed there. Also, uh, myself and some of the other more experienced BSD people are happy to answer questions about BSD and ZFS. Uh, and also, yes, if you bring your copies of FreeBSD Mastery, uh, ZFS or Advanced ZFS, I will scribble on them for you uh, <laughs> or whatever else. So yeah, hoping to see uh, a bunch of people there. And uh, then we have the NiceBug meeting. The March meeting will feature Dr. Paul Vixie and his new talk, Operating Systems as Dumb Pipes. Yep. Uh, so the, the the February meeting is today as we record this. So if you're watching live, you should go tonight. Uh, and if you're watching when this comes out tomorrow, you missed it. Um, but that's why we're giving you as much notice as possible about the March meeting, which uh, I'm pretty sure will be the first Wednesday in March. Uh, but check out the link on the website here. I'm sure it'll be posted there any day now. Um, probably they will update the website at the meeting tonight. Uh, and that will announce uh, the location and the exact time of the next nice bug meeting where they will have uh, Dr. Vixie. Uh, then in the little further northern part of Europe, there's the eighth meetup of the Stockholm Beast user group happening on March 3rd at 1800 hours uh, in Stockholm, of course. That's the place they were, where they started and are still having those meetings. And from what I hear, it's been popular. They already have like 26 people at least wanting to go. Mm -hmm. uh, Meetup.com. Yep, and it's uh, I guess right near the central train station, so it's easy to get to. Uh, and there's instructions on the page there. It's at the B3 offices on the 10th floor. Mm -hmm. uh, also, if you have anything you'd like to present at their meetup, uh, whether that is in Swedish or English, uh, please get in touch and let them know, and they will add it to the schedule. Exactly, yeah. And last but not least is the Polish BSD user group. Uh, they meet on February 11 at 18.15. Yeah, uh, so same day as my meetup, but obviously being on a different continent, uh, their their meeting will start a number of hours before mine. <laughs> yeah. 
So yeah, if you're if you're sad because you live in Europe and couldn't come to Alan's BSD meetup, <laughs> go to one of these other ones. Yeah, there's plenty of uh, those going around, or you start your own if you are very far from these other mm-hmm. places, and then we uh, then you let us know, and we let other people know about it. Uh, the Polish BSD user group meets at the Food Security Office in Warsaw, and will have. Um, talks about FreeBSD Enterprise Storage, traversing the AST, abstract syntax tree with Clang, and IP box. Which, the rest of that is in Polish, so I don't know what it says. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm a bit rusty in that. <laughs> Time for feedback and questions this week. Uh, we have mm-hmm. questions, but we're running short. Uh, we're drying out a little bit since we're doing so many uh, double episodes recently. Uh, so uh, to help us out in this department... Keep sending questions. Yep, send us those to feedback at bsdnow.tv and anything that you uh, always wanted to know or maybe you're struggling with a problem on the computer side of things, then uh, we'll be happy to help if we know the answer will mention it here on the show or if you found an answer for someone else's question that we couldn't answer this is also the address to write your solution to uh, the first uh, question this week is coming from sean about zfs and creation dates uh, sean writes just discovered your podcast and have been listening to recent episodes on episode 313 at time of set 52 13 you discussed a listener question about file creation dates and freena slash zfs recently been down a similar rabbit hole Far be it for me to correct Alan Jude regarding FreeBSD slash ZFS with Smiley. Uh, but in fact, the touch command cannot change the creation, aka birth time, of a file. Uh, there's a forum blog, a uh, forum post on uh, FreeBSD, forums.freebsd.org about this. And in fact, I found no good way to do it without using U times uh, sat from C. And even that is torturous. There's a different bug uh, report here. Sounds like a nice trivial patch to the touch command to add the functionality. Mm, yeah. Uh, and then Sean ended up down this rabbit hole because this, he discovered that when sh- copying files from Mac or Windows to FreeNAS, the creation date is underscore discarded underscore and set to match the modification date. Happily, this is fixed in the upcoming 11.3. Oh, excellent. Now, ah, this is a link to Irix Systems Jira system. And perhaps that's how that other listener got into this situation. Ah, that might very well be. And it'd be interesting to see how um, Freenas dealt with this and see if it's something that should just be in general FreeBSD as well. Yeah. I wonder if there's a test for that in the ZFS uh, uh, test suite. Since it's not a ZFS command, probably not. It might be worth looking into. Yeah, because of the like the birth time of, of files on ZFS should be right. Well, it's not really a ZFS thing, but something it's so, something in the OS test somewhere should deal deal with this. So yes, thank you to Sean for sending in more information and uh, all the links to put that together. Always good to connect the dots here for other people. Christopher is next uh, with a, a question or help on ZFS disaster recovery. Ooh, that sounds horrible. Uh, but we'll see. Um, Hi, Alan at Benedict is what he writes. I have another ZFS question. Unfortunately, not because of a good reason. A short background, if you're interested. The host of my virtual server running 11.3 FreeBSD had a hardware failure. Apparently, the main board of the hypervisor died and they moved the hard disk to a new machine and booted all VMs up again. That's what I've been told. My machine didn't come up. The bootloader complained that it can't boot Z root. When I saw that, the first goosebumps showed up. So I booted up the FreeBSD installer on this VM in rescue mode and investigated. I don't remember the exact error message, but it told me something like, hey, something's wrong, but you can import the pool with capital F, but behold, there will be 15 seconds of data loss and data scrub is highly recommended afterwards. I gladly accepted 15 seconds of data loss and indeed the pool was mountable and the VM bootable again. Well, not everything was okay though. My easy jail VM containing the database didn't come up because the jail's pool didn't get mounted. There's an output of zpool status dash v for us to see. So there's the pool. And yeah, scrub is still in progress. That's fine. And there's the error listing way at the bottom. Permanent errors have been detected in some files here. And some of the easy jail one with Maria. I guess this is MariaDB running. And I have tried to rename the Maria folder to get it recreated. As you can see, the lack of redundancy killed me here. Yeah, a pool with a single disk with a lot of checksum errors. Yeah, so what I don't understand until today is how the directory entries for the metadata can get corrupted. This hasn't been touched for months, and since ZFS does copy on write, I don't understand how this hardware failure could corrupt this. 
Well, the metadata for a directory gets updated almost any time any file gets updated in that directory, right? Uh, adding a file or removing a file and so on updates the directory. Uh, so that can be part of that. Um, some of those offsets are weird, like the one that's all Fs, that's probably not a real object. Um, the 0x14ce is likely an actual one, although the fact that it doesn't have a file name means it was either just metadata or it was a file that's since been deleted and only exists as a snapshot. Yeah. It can be hard to say. Uh, sometimes this is recoverable, sometimes it's not. It depends what's gone wrong. You know, most metadata there are two copies of, even in ZFS. Um, and so sometimes it's possible to keep going. Uh, sometimes it's not. It depends. The other problem with the, the basically force rewind that you had to do, the capital F import that deleted 15 seconds worth of data, is that you do copy on write, but now that you're not using the old copy of this block, it can get overwritten with a new copy of a new block. But then if you rewind far enough back, that block was supposed to contain the old copy, the unmodified copy of a block. But if there's no snapshot to keep it around, then it doesn't. And that's how you can end up with these checksum errors. Now, usually ZFS won't reallocate the same block for a number of transaction groups to avoid this problem. But yeah, it can be that if you have to rewind, you have to be careful that some of the blocks that you're referencing haven't been overwritten with different data and then are going to have checksum errors. Okay, so that might be the reason. Um, it definitely shouldn't happen, but I guess you... So you could recover most of yours and... Uh, um, oh yeah, the outage happened 10 minutes before the daily backup job run. <clears throat> uh, but you survived this loss. Okay, that's is fine. This is important data, but you can still recover that or are not too critical missing it. So I took a disk image on the VM shortly after the zpool status command here. Is there a slight chance that with some ZFS wizardry I could be able to restore the jail and therefore the database files? Possibly. It's hard to say. Because um, it, like, it doesn't look like there's very extensive damage. It mostly matters if that 0x0 is the root of the object or something else. Uh, so with a disk image, uh, it may be possible to do stuff. It'd be better if you had a disk image from before you did the import with the capital F that does the rewinding because then you could try with and without the re rewinding and so on. But yeah, you might be able to. Um, the ZDB, the ZFS debugger tool is very useful for that kind of thing. Okay. So there might be a chance to recover some more data. Uh, but this might, might require a bit of more wizardry in the ZFS space. This is not for uh, users that have just started using, well, you probably don't, but... Yeah, because the other thing is... Um, in a situation like this where, again, your you know, disk DA0 is not a real disk, it's virtual, ZFS assumes when it says, hey, flush this data and tell me once this data is safely on the disk, it assumes that when the disk says, yes, that data is safely on the disk, that it's true. Mm. But if the backing storage is lying to, to make it perform faster, then that can result in ZFS assumed this data was safe uh, because the disk promised it was safe. Uh, but if the disk lied, then uh, you can end up with this corruption. So think about maybe doing uh, more frequent backups in case you are running into this, and or moving some of the data off-site to so in case you can switch over in case this happens again. Okay, I hope that was helpful, and you got a couple of uh, tips uh, from us. Yeah, um, snapshots might have helped you here. Yeah, cold standby. It's hard to say. It, it can't hurt to have snapshots. <laughs> and send them periodically to a second system. Right, but even without that, just yeah. having them uh, means that you might have been able to get back the MariaDB data set from an hour before instead of having to go back 23 hours. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a lot of time, especially when you're 10 minutes before the next. Yeah. It, uh, snapshots obviously don't guarantee any protection against corruption, but they improve your odds slightly. Okay, and uh, last but not least is Mike with encrypted ZFS sent. Uh, Mike writes, Hi, I'm running Debian Buster 10 with native ZFS encryption as well as FreeBSD 12.1, where no encryption is being used. My FreeBSD server is my backup server, and I would like to use ZFS sent from my Debian server to my BSD server. So he lists a couple of uh, information from his pool, uh, versions of his Kmod uh, in Debian. And so here's his uh, ZFS send line he provides. So it's an hourly snapshot. 
sent using capital R, yeah, to and he does a receive dash DVU and to his backup slash data data set. He gets the following error. Cannot send uh, this pool encrypt data set may not be sent with properties without the raw flag. Cannot receive, fail to read from stream. Right. So what that's saying is you can't do a send with capital R, which sends the properties, including, you know, encryption equals on, uh, if you don't use the raw flag. So you want to do a set of a send without the capital R, which if you have sub data sets means you'll have to send them separately. Um, but you would still be able to do a send there if you want. Uh, you just need to, on the send side, not use capital R, which means uh, replicate this whole thing, including all the properties and everything. Uh, you'd have to do it without the properties to send the uh, encrypted data. He tried sending it with the uh, dash W flag, which is the raw send, uh, but obviously the FreeBSD 12.1 machine doesn't have support for receiving encrypted blocks because it doesn't know about encryption. Not yet, though. Uh, so in this case, it's slightly confusing. It says feature flags 1C20004, but that's ZFS send feature flags, not the pool feature flags. They're a separate set of flags. Yeah, I see. Okay. Yeah, this might be the, the reason. Yeah, so he asks, uh, can I create a data set on the FreeBSD server specifically to receive the snapshots with different feature flags than the pool, or do I need to have to change a feature flag on the pool? So if you want to receive it still encrypted, so you want to send it from the your main machine to the backup machine, have it stay encrypted the whole time, you would have to have newer ZFS on FreeBSD. So you'd have to use uh, the open ZFS port on FreeBSD and basically install the newer beta version of ZFS on FreeBSD. Um, there's complications there. You have to be running at least 12.1. Uh, and you know there's some weird interactions with having two copies of ZFS on your machine. Uh, and you know no promises that the open ZFS port is is bug free at this point, uh, but it would let you do that. Your other option is if you choose to send without the capital R and without the dash W, you can replicate the data, but it will arrive on the FreeBSD backup machine not encrypted. Mm, which is not what you want, yeah. Which, if that's okay, then problem solved. If it's not, then you have the more complicated thing of uh, doing the um, upgrading your version of ZFS and FreeBSD to support encryption. So then both are using the same features. So hopefully that helps. So it looks like he's running 12.1. So yes, you could get the open ZFS port installed and have uh, a version, uh, the newer version of ZFS, basically the same. It's uh, actually even newer than uh, ZFS on Linux 0.8. Uh, but it, it's not ready for production. No guarantees it's perfect yet. But since it's for a backup, maybe it's the, the right answer for your, your problem here. Okay, so this pretty much wraps up our episode for this week. Again, if you have anything for us, feedback, questions, show ideas, topics, uh, send it to feedback at bsdnow.tv and that will appear then in a future episode. 